Well, next, to the depths of northern Thailand, where back in 2018, the world was gripped by the life and death story of 12 schoolboys and their soccer coach trapped in a flooded cave. A new documentary delves into this story with never-before-seen footage. The Rescue by Academy Award-winning directors and husband and wife Elizabeth Chai Sarelli and Jimmy Chin reveals the peril of the daring mission. And here they are telling Hari Srinivasan new details about the miraculous rescue. Fiona, thanks. Chai Vassar Haley, Jimmy Chin, thank you both for joining us. Uh, first, I want to ask, well, the, the topic itself, it, it seems like the entire world watched this unfold in near real time, day after day. We had so many news reports about this. And I wonder what motivated both of you to try to take on this topic that you'd think everybody kind of knew about. Uh, Chai, let me start with you. Well, I think like many people around the world, we were, I mean, fascinated by the story as it transpired. I mean, just living through the downs, the ups. Um, I think if you think back to 2018, you know, it was a pretty, I don't know, complicated moment, you know, in the world. And here was a story that reminded us that, you know, people can come together and make the impossible happen, right? You know, and also as parents, we were very moved um, by the story. So I think it is it is one of the great stories of, you know, the past 10 years. And the characters are exactly the type of, like, unique characters that we like. Um, and that there was so much that wasn't actually known about what, what actually happened. And um, we thought it was an important story to try to tell. Jimmy? Like Chai, we were both really moved by the story and and a, a hopeful story uh, a story about our common humanity given the divisive times uh, that we're living through that here was a story where people from different countries and cultures and religious backgrounds set aside their differences to you know do something um, because they felt the moral imp imperative to do it I want to play uh, the, the clip of the sort of initial moment that the divers make contact with these children. And we took our equipment off on the other side of the passage, made our way over to them. I mean, clearly, John has a son, and then I haven't got children. I've structured my life to avoid children as much as possible. But John is a cub master, so he's used to dealing with groups of children. Say thumbs up. Say yay. Yes. yay. He got them to do a motivational yay. exercise. Everybody say yeah. Yay. Excellent. Say say hello Americans. Hello Americans. Hello Thai Navy. Hello Thai Navy. Say hello Australians. Hello Australians. Hello Chinese. Hello Chinese. And thank you, everybody else. And thank you, everybody else. Okay, we see you soon. As we left, pretty much all of them came and hugged us individually. I made them a promise that I would come back. I am really happy. We, we are happy too. Thank you so much. Okay. So, where you come from? England, UK. Oh. As we went around the corner and kitted up, total silence between me and John, just a look into each other's faces, thinking we may be the only ones that ever see them. That was a distinct possibility. The whole journey back, all I was thinking was, what on earth are we going to do now? So when you see that footage, what goes through your head? I get really emotional. I mean, because that the clip you just played was actually the what I called the holy grail of the clips because John insisted. He's like, I remember filming this. I know I filmed it. And yet he'd never seen the images. So he was even beginning to to question his own memory. And it's just really emotional for me because of how much work went into trying to get the material and also just how it was the right thing to do in that this is a story about what connects us and being able this footage allow audiences the experience of what it felt like to actually be in the cave and be in that moment. I mean, that what we just watched is actually the moment where they found the children. And that's, I don't know, it's, it, I always get a little choked up about it. Yeah. Jimmy, when you're watching that and you realize this is, 
days and days and days, the parents of these children have literally been praying and they've been in different stages of grief and acceptance and tension, right? And the fact that those children were in there alive, you can see on their faces, they're, they've, they've lost weight because they haven't been eating. And it's just so remarkable that they exist. But that moment at the very end of that clip where the diver says, we might be the only ones to ever see them alive. That is so sort of real and dark. Yeah, in that moment, I feel like there's so much complexity with the emotions that, you know, I feel and 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 hopefully audiences feel because there's hope, but there's also this moment that, you know, you realize even if we found the kids, there's there's just no way we're going to be able to get them out. And then on top of that, you see these kids, they've been sitting in the dark for 10 days with no food, and there's no complaining or crying or whimpering how they're staying so composed in that moment. You know, so there's just a lot in that moment um, that I, hit, I, I feel like hits a lot of different notes um, for me uh, emotionally. Most people, I think, when they start watching the film, are they're not going to realize that it was a volunteer group that did this, right? That somehow it was this band of people that knew each other, called each other, said, you know, if I could build the best team, here's what it would require. That, I mean, it's just one of those tiny details that might get kind of forgotten over time, but it's the sort of central part of this story. We all followed it, uh, thought we knew what happened. And really, I mean, most people, I think, don't really understand what, what, what happened and who these characters were. Uh, I think at the upper echelon of, you know, this like very fringe, uh, esoteric sport of cave diving, it's very similar as in, in like high altitude climbing or alpine climbing. It's a very small community. Everybody kind of knows each other. And then realizing, oh, they're electricians, IT consultants, a meteorologist, I mean, you know, everyday uh, guys that are coming in and they're not even getting paid and they do this remarkable task uh, when basically they have everything to lose if things go wrong and they still go ahead and do it because of their, you know, moral imperative. I want to play a clip of uh, a little bit of an introduction to some of these divers as well. Um, let's take a look. Caving is clearly about the exploration side of it. Some of the dives we do, you could be hours in, totally reliant on artificial light, artificial heating. It's like being in space. Probably the purest adventure you could have. It takes a peculiar type of person to be a cave diving explorer. What makes someone want to be an explorer? I think it's two parts ego, one part curiosity, one part um, um, lack of confidence in yourself and the need to prove yourself. You know, maybe I was no good at footy and cricket, but at least I can, you know, cave dive quite well. I think it's fair to say all of us were not team players. None of us are very good with ball skills. I was a loser. I'm terrible at team sports. <laughs> I think doesn't play well with others is a phrase that you're looking for. When the divers go in, the first people that they find were not the children. But what happened there and what was that rescue like? Well, when John and uh, Rick first went in uh, to chamber three, they discovered you know, four water workers who had basically been asleep and, and missed the evacuation. So they, they were now trapped in, in uh, the cave, the submerged cave, but they were on slightly higher ground. Uh, and you know, Rick and John weren't sure if 
you know, the cave was going to flood further. So they had to make a very split second decision saying, okay, we have to dive these guys out as soon as possible. Yeah, I think John and Rick describe it as it turned into an underwater wrestling match. I mean, just human instinct to survive. They started to, you know, basically wrestle with the the divers because they thought they were, well, they, because they were submerged. The significance of that moment, though, is that they were only underwater for 30 to 40 seconds um, trying to get through this one submerged section. And they were adults and they they completely panicked. And what John and Rick immediately realized was we can't even get a, an adult to stay calm for 30 seconds underwater, much less, you know, when they later discovered we're going to have to swim these kids out for two to three hours. The entire idea that ends up becoming the way that these kids get out, the idea to dose children with <laughs> anesthesia and somehow get them kind of in a sleeping position to drag them out for two hours underwater. I mean, that just, you know, from the sort of initial text of the idea, you're thinking, well, clearly they, they must have come up with something else. Like, we're, we're going to move on from this part of the film. <laughs> but when you start watching it, you're like, they're, what? They're really, this is it? This is how it happened? As Dr. Harris's wife, Fiona, says, it's ludicrous. Like, it's just so outrageous, even the idea, but it was their only choice. When they rescued those four water workers initially, that was real like reality check for them in that those were four adults who were underwater for 30 to 40 seconds and they panicked. So there was no, no other choice. And the courage it takes to actually accept that and proceed, I find astonishing. There are moments where they realize that if anything goes wrong, they might be blamed for this. That that there is kind of, you know, there's the great upside if you get the children out safely. But if you find them dead, if you have to recover their bodies, if you're not able to recover their bodies, I mean, there's so many different ways that could have turned out differently where these divers would not be considered the heroes that we're seeing them as today. To be very clear, they, they really believe that saving one child would be a success. And that's what's so astonishing kind of about this idea of how they made the decisions and how selfless it was. I mean, as Jimmy said, like they had everything to lose. Like Dr. Harris would forever be known as the anesthesiologist who killed 13 people. Half of them are fathers. They know the psychic kind of psychological price they would pay. And it was still more important for them to be able to try to save these children than you couldn't live with other, like, other possibility. And that's where like the absolute morality of it really is interesting because like they were they were their best selves and if we all could be our best selves and act with acts of generosity like we'd be in a very different place right now as a society uh, chai we should mention that there was a fatality in this a member a former member of the thai navy died during this rescue operation and you were able to sit down with his widow uh and it's just a really compelling and moving interview i mean here's a guy who looked in otherwise amazing shape, right? I mean, not just from his years of training, but even afterwards, he had volunteered to do this and bring wetsuits uh, down there to these kids. Um, what, was, what was it like kind of discovering things about his life and what he was like? I mean, it's heartbreaking um, the more you learn about Saman. And it's also Saman Gunan's you know, kind of selfless act of like volunteering to come back and help the Thai Navy SEALs. I mean, he'd been retired for um, 18 years or something. He'd last served in 2003. It's so emblematic of the story itself in that it's an act of generosity. And no one really had ever confirmed how Saman had died. And as part of our efforts of speaking to everybody involved, um, including the Admiral of the Thai Navy SEALs, like we were finally able to confirm that he was taking in these wetsuits. And I mean, it would be a very, very difficult um, task because of the buoyancy of the wetsuits. So he had already delivered them and was on his way back when he ran out of air. Um, and I had the chance to, you know, to sit with his widow. And also, I mean, really, after I met her, she gave us his phone. So all that footage is actually footage from his phone. And that also was like a strange way of like looking into somebody's life where you feel like it's so intimate um, but we never had the chance to actually meet him. Watching the film, you realize all of the other things 
that were kind of at stake here beyond just the kid's life. If that wasn't important enough, you had kind of this geopolitical layer, you had this spiritual layer, you had just the, the, the grief of the parents. I mean, you just, there were so many things kind of swirling around that site. It's a very complicated story. And who's to say the prayers didn't save the children, right? And so that was part of our intention always was to try to honor the complexity of the story and honor the East-West situation, honor the miscommunications, because it really just demonstrates how, like, you know, against all odds, these people came together to save the children. I actually walked the cave and I walked to the back of the cave. And until I saw it for myself, I didn't, you, you can't understand just the sheer scale. And when you see it, you understand why you needed thousands of people supporting these 10 divers. Jimmy, were you um, surprised by how close it all came? I mean, near the end, you know, there's this moment where as an audience member, you're saying, oh, thank goodness I got the kids. And then all of a sudden people are like rushing out of the cave because guess what? Like if we had waited an, another day, maybe this whole thing would have been a much more tragic story. Yeah, in many ways, it was miracle upon miracle that happened. Uh, um, I, I think I truly believe, and and I and I know that the the divers believe this too. At any given moment, over those days during the rescue, something could have gone horribly wrong, catastrophically wrong, like any moment around any turn. And they had to be perfect too. You know, just one bump on the on on their face masks. Um, there's no redundancy in that system. It's like, you know, if that thing leaks and it fills with water, it's over. And, you know, they're moving them for two to three hours through these caves. It's just incredible. Shai Vesserheli and Jimmy Chin, the film is called The Rescue. Thank you both for joining us. Thank, Thank you for having us.